So Soli Levi, photographer, is it wildlife, landscape, drone, you name it, you're doing it uh, on a really, really high level. My mind was blown uh, a week ago when we made the first contact and I, I found found out about about you on the on Instagram. It was just a incredible experience for me. And then uh, my whole family kind of freaked out uh, that night uh, when we kind of like said that we will do this. Uh, this is very exciting for for a lot of us in in, in Bali. So welcome to the show, first of all. Thank, thanks for having me. Brighton-based travel photographer, born and raised in Congo. That one is really kind of interesting for me. Uh, uh, tell me a little bit about this growing up in Congo, because that must have just that, that that sounds incredible. Well, um, well, my granddad was there uh, in 1938. He was um, living in. Uh, at the time, it was northern Rhodesia, which was Z Zambia, mm -hmm. and that was in 1938. Then my dad came in 1957, and then we have all our family living in Africa, basically. So there is, it's not, we're not a big community, but we, um, we, you know, we, we grew up there. So we, you know, life, life is, you know, in Africa, life is a bit different than Europe, and it's. Yes. Um, it, there's a lot of freedom. There's a lot of you have access to a lot of things that um, is very restricted in other in other areas. Yep. So going up there basically was was good in the sense that you know you you are in the wild, you're in nature automatically. You know you you don't have all the luxuries of uh, Europe, but uh, you don't you realize that being out in Africa and in contact with nature is uh, something that happens to you. Uh, naturally and I've always been drawn you know I've traveled after that all around the world and I've always wanted to come back to Africa and now I feel more uh, I realize uh, with time that um, there's so much in Africa that we still don't know of and I uh, I'm working now in Namibia mm -hmm. uh, Congo because the situation has changed a lot you know there's a lot of uh, political unrest but um, oh, yes you still have that in your blood and it's growing up makes you always come back you know in parts of of africa do, do, you, do you still have some connections with congo or or that is kind of uh, the, the you know that story kind of ended i have all my friends there i have a lot of mm -hmm. friends there but uh, to live there it's, it's changed a lot you know it's one of the countries that takes a lot to get uh, back yeah on Corruption. No, 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 I understand. I mean, like, I, I, I did a little bit of research, and I, I, I didn't want to, to kind of like draw this, this thing into political things because there's really no reason because there's yeah. really not, not much we can do about it. Uh, but uh, the, the, the history of it's just, it's, it's brutality on the, on the level of, uh, yeah, that is, that is chilling. Have exactly. you ever, ever went and see gorillas in Congo? Yes, I did. I went to see them in. Uh... The border between uh, back then it used to be called Zaire, the Belgian mm -hmm. Congo, changed its name to Zaire. So I did go there uh, in Kahuzi Biega National Park, and mm -hmm. um, that was back before the massacres of Rwanda. Yep. So there in '91, and we climbed up all the way um, in um, the Ruwenzori Forest, which is where the national park of Kahuzi Biega is, and we sat around with silverback. Oh, we God. Jungle. What, what with, is that feeling like? What is that like? It, it's uh, well, back in the days when there was no, not really tourism, it was really different because all you need to need to do is find your own tracker. So we had our own guide and uh, he knew where they were based on where they were sleeping the night before. So we had, it was, it's a jungle. It's such a huge jungle that uh, it extends as far as the eye can see and you have to look for them. Yeah. So the experience was, you know, it's just looking for them took more longer. Sometimes you can be three hours walking in the forest or four hours. So you don't know. So you're lucky if it's under three hours walking in the dense, dense, dense forest until you find them. And it wasn't a good experience because, you know, we sat around there with, with the whole family. There's at one point silverbacks 
came straight towards me and I had to put my head down because you can't look at them in the eye. You know, it's like a threat if you look at them in the eye. So oh, they yeah. all t- put your head down and, and you know what? Excellent. It was fun. It was, uh, I was a bit nervous, but took some photos at the time, but it was, uh, it was one of the best experiences I've had. Yeah, I mean, are, are you planning to go back uh, to, 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 to see them again and photograph them with the ability that you have now? I would love to do it. I would love to go to Kivu, which is the, the area, but it's a very, it's a hot spot there. You know, 12 rangers were killed there about two months ago. Wow. And yeah, they yeah. Pay, you'll get killed a lot because of the, all the rebels around the area. So yeah. it's not really a safe place. Even if you go with armed rangers, even if you go with people with AK-47, it's still an area where yeah, you don't things know what happen. Happened. You know, they attacked the Okapi, Okapi Wildlife Reserve also there. So it's... Yeah, know, it's, you, you got to wait a little bit, I guess. You got to wait and, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it will take a while before this happens. But, you know, yeah. a lot of people are out there taking care of it. Of course. So now, I mean, like, we, we were going to move to, to Namibia. Um, I didn't know this, but it's the second lowest population density in the world, only beaten by Mongolia, if my research is correct. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's packed with nothing. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, it's incredible place. It's one of my dream locations, really. And before we go and sum up this thing as if, because you're, 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 you know, like doing the, 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 the tours, you know, like there with, with, uh, with certain photographers. And I would like to go on the kind of like, like a virtual tour with you. So we'll go place by place. But can you sum up Namibia for me in like very short sum up of, of the whole place? Well, Namibia, like you said, it's a, there's 2.6 million people living there. And it's a huge country, huge, huge country. And everything is scattered around. So everywhere that you want to go has to be long distances. You got to go in the Kalahari, it's a long distance from the capital. You mm-hmm. want to go to the Skeleton Coast, it's another four hours, five hours drive. Everything is just scattered around. And um, a lot of people there work, depend on tourism, because um, there's not much really going on there. So everybody has lodges there. They used to have farms that have converted into lodges. And they, that's where they have, you can have access to all the wildlife, the game drives. But you also have a different variety. You have the Kalahari on the south, then you have the dunes close to the very old dunes and very high dunes, the highest dunes in the world. And um, it's a photographer's paradise because everywhere you go, it's just breathtaking. It's amazing. And the difference between Namibia and other countries is that you, it's, it's easy to access and easy to drive. There's not yeah. really holes you can easily go from one place even though you have gravels gravel roads you e- easily can move around the country but it's not about going there rushing it's about taking your time and breathing in the country and being uh, being in contact with nature and that's the whole point not really to just go there and just take a few photos but also like rediscover yourself and that's what namibia has and really you lots of people that go there always want to come back because it, it leaves it leaves them with a special connection let's go point by point do you remember the first time you visited kalahari yes i remember the first time and it's something that you always hear on on the news or bbc or an yes. you grew about. up with it yeah you know the, there was a movie the gods must be crazy mm-hmm. that, that's uh, about the bushmen and the life but you never really you know, every, the red earth and um, camel thorn trees all around, just the heat of the place. But you never imagine until you go there and then you, you identify it quickly. You know that you are at that special place, one of the most ancient desert in the world, basically. The, yeah, but the most ancient desert, which is also where the Bushmen, the sand people live and the most ancient tribe. So my first, my first impression was just, wow. Everything was just, everything was wild. There was no why, where, and who. It's just wow. And that's this, it. You, you wake up, wow. You go to sleep, wow. You look at this Milky Way, wow. Everything is just, there's nothing I could do. And, you know, yeah, I, at, I some, at some point, you record. Same thing. 
Yeah, at some point you just have to record yourself because I mean you just kind of like lose your voice with wow. Hey, yeah, wow. Yeah, it it sounds it sounds like that. I mean, like I grew up with it myself. You know, watching it exactly what you what you're describing. Uh, let's talk about that Namibian sky in Kalahari because uh, the, the 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 some of the uh, cloud formations. I mean, and, and I've been in the places where. There is just nothing around you in Indonesia, you know, like we travel far, far in, in, into Indonesia. And, and I can kind of like once you are conflicted with that sky, there's there's something happens and there is cloud formation. There is night sky full of stars. What, what is your favorite when it comes to sky? Because you 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 have both. You, and especially your night sky photographs are incredible. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's a place where you can see the Milky Way with your eye, with your bare eye. And because of no light pollution, so you know where you have that really nice long strip of stars. You can really see it, and all you need to do is point your camera. You don't really need to to see to adjust and look at a map or look at your app to see where it's located. You just see it, especially when the moon is on the other side, and it's, you can see it. And 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 what's amazing is that um, it's everywhere you go. You can you, it's accessible. The evening comes. Nine o'clock, ten o'clock. You just put your camera up. You leave it open for thirty seconds. Your shutter for thirty seconds. Um, and you're... A high ISO, and then that's it. You can. It's easy. It's one of the easiest places, basically, to capture a night sky. Yeah, I've seen some. I mean, some of your photographs of night sky. I have never seen the, 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 that many stars. I've seen many, many, but yeah. uh, but something like this is is just incredible. And I'm, I'm I'm assuming that the pollution is really on a, on a, on a, on a really low level because of there's you know, no pollution. No one there, there's no, yeah, it's it's just uh, it seems incredible. What is your favorite thing to photograph in in, in Kalahari? Because ostrich just seems to be, you know, they they have some some sort of uh, incredible uh, thing with you. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, it it depends what uh, what I have in front of me. If I see uh, an oryx, a gamsbok, or I can see you know, a giraffe, or a, a cheetah, or anything, it depends. Or it can be like it depends on I'm not strictly in one thing I don't really like one thing more than the other I, I quite like um, a story a good story by itself something quirky something funny something out of the common mm -hmm. is what I'm looking for something about un, uh, out of the ordinary and that's basically all you need to do you can't just check, take the same photos mm -hmm. that everybody else has been um, has been taken. So you have to look for something that, uh, whether it's a mere cat, something small, whether it's a big animal, yeah. there's so much information everywhere, but you just have to be um, aware of everything around you. So if I, it can be, it can, I don't know, it's, it depends on the situation, but there is, you will know when you see it that yeah. this is what. Yeah. No, I, I understand that point. I mean, being a photographer myself, I mean, it's really, really, really hard to describe uh, what is a favorite thing because I mean, it's, it seems that you know what, what exactly what you're saying is like when you see it, you know, and then you know just don't fuck it up. I mean, that's yeah. pretty much how it goes. Uh, some people, Bushman, uh, yeah. that that seems uh, uh, like an incredible, incredible uh, group of people. Number one, uh, incredible yeah. way of life. And you are taking people to 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 see them. How did you how do you organize this? The, uh, how did you organize this this uh, experience actually to to go in and and, and spend the uh, spend some time with them? Well, basically, uh, they are scattered all around the Namibia, so they live also in uh, in, res in in different areas of the country. So where wherever you go. They will tell you, yeah, there is a village there or there is a, a tribe there. So all you can do is um, come with some kind of arrangement, whoever is there. And then you you go there and, and hang out with them in the okay. day. Uh, you know, it's like any tribes, um, people, you know, they do, they mind their own business. And it's just you going there and you just ask your permission to take photos and being really humble about everything. But very discreet also. So don't spend too long there, you know take the shots and then you know don't be too much of a of a, imposing character don't be too intrusive so you take your shots go there you know you have a very small amount of time but everybody's got a limit of how much you can take your shots you know so and be discreet so that's uh 
how I organize it is because when you go there, you want to experience and maybe yeah, all together. It's just a, the culture, the tribes, the landscape, and people when they start, when they want to be, want to learn about photography, you know, I think, you know, either you go and take an online course or you stay in your room or you go to university or you come on a, on a tour in Namibia and you yeah, have yeah. Hand- so it's just people of course it's not the same budget but i think that in the short amount of time they come with me on the tour i will try to make them aware of their surrounding more than anything else more than the technical issue about this because it's more of understanding what's around and following the scene following for example there's an animal in the desert or you can you know you want to catch it capture that moment and you just wait for the right time when you have a nice background nice foreground the light is perfect so you follow the scene and i try to make people aware when you compose a shot is to always to be prepared for the moment when it will come i'm not saying it's going to come all the time yeah but uh, it's all improvised and nothing is staged so when it's not when it's not improv when it's improvised you, you it feels more rewarding because it's not something set up yeah 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 that's uh, what we- uh, yes, that sounds. I mean, like, sounds absolutely logical, and and and, and how it should be done, really. Uh, um, back to back to this uh, the, the the Bushman tribes. Uh, did you ever had any experience uh, outside of, of of taking people groups? Uh, did you ever spend uh, them? Uh, what what are they really like? I mean, I, I heard that. I mean, they're kind of nomadic, and they don't leave the footprint anywhere, really. You know, that they they kind of like move around. Is that is that fair assessment or yeah but you have to remember that nowadays you know because you know we're nowadays it's more um it's not the way they're not living exactly like the way they used to live 200 years ago so it's sure. they have oh every they have you know they're not going to have to hunt every day they have uh they're not going to have to look for water they're not going to have to go through all the hardship that they used to go 100 years ago because you know wherever they are in 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 a farm or in a lodge, they're also provided with everything they need. So it kind of like, it's not the same way that they used to live because they, uh, you know, it, it, it's changed so oh, much. Just, I mean, changed. the Western is in the film, yeah. They really, they will not go hungry like before because they're always um, supported by, um, by in, the, in, the, in the reserve or whatever. They're supported by whoever runs it. So, so it's, their lifestyle has changed a lot, but for photography, you know, people also go there to take photos to remind us of how they used to live. Of course, of course. Uh, well, I mean, I, I also heard that the, that the in 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 government of, of Namibia has asked a Bushman to be a representative in a par- parliament in 2015. So it's like you know this this kind of uh, you know the, the I guess uniting western kind of living with with this old old old, old kind of living is is uh, is happening everywhere i mean how, what what is your feeling about this i mean like you know what what will happen what are the good things and the bad things about uh, about this infra- infiltration of of western kind of living into uh, this tribal tri- tribal communities well first of all uh, there is um there's, they give employment, there's work, there is things to do they, you know, there's always, uh, uh, like, because of times have changed so much that um, tourism mainly is what brings work, not just for the Bushmen, for everybody in the country. Yes. Okay, so when you don't have tourism, especially with what's happening in 2020 with the no, COVID, yeah. it just affects everybody. So. When you have tourism, when you have people coming from the West, coming to, to Namibia, it brings, it brings stability, it brings jobs, it brings food. So it's all part of the chain. It's not one thing or another. Everybody is affected. Bushmen, just like somebody running a, um, a tour company, renting cars, they're all affected. So they need, they need people to come and visit the country because lodges are going to be closed for months and months and they, oh yes 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 and they they probably employ 100 or 200 people and these people have families so it adds up to about 2000 3000 people so oh, everybody are affected 
So that's why whether it's a Bushman or whether it's a Herrero or whatever, whether it's a Himba, they mm-hmm. sell jewelry, they sell, you know, things to the people coming in and this, this little bit of money helps them buy milk, buy the essentials. Yes. And if nobody buys those bracelets or those little souvenirs or comes to take photos and give them money for the photos, if they don't, if they don't have that, uh, there's no other way really to, to, to survive, have, really. Yeah, yeah I understand. So, I understand. So all those little things, you know, that you get there, even, the, you know, it affects them. So that's why it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I I understand your point. I mean, I mean, I've been in those situations myself. It's it's all this kind of like this conflict, but it's also what you're saying. I mean, like it it, it does help tourism is is growing and it just cannot be stopped. You know, like uh, it, it really so responsible tourism is hopefully where we will go after this. Uh, you know, COVID. So so we'll see what happens. Um, I wanted to talk about roads of Namibia because they are visually some of the most impressive things, and they're many many photographs that you took of roads in, in especially uh, what is your favorite road my favorite road is any dirt road to be honest uh, yeah. any dirt road that goes between one of the top locations especially uh, they all do, but the good thing about the roads there they're always leveled so you don't have those holes okay so it's gravel but it's they don't have potholes so that's a good thing because you, you don't break your suspension or you don't blow a tire. So any road based, any gravel road, you got, you know, you have a sense of adventure when you drive in those roads. You know, you have a, you have the dust flying, you know, oh, yeah. you, you can hear the gravel under. Make sure you close your windows because every time you break, everything comes in, everything, all your bags full of dust. You have that sense of adventure like when you were a kid, you know, uh, riding a bike in a dirt road it's the same thing you 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 or you know that's the good thing about it it's just not a good road but it limits the amount of people going there because it will kill the car yeah. and you, people don't want to break their car so you do need a proper four by four because if you go with a regular car you won't make it so that any road with gravel keeps all yeah, yeah, every, so all only the hardcore adventurers go there all the other guys don't come they go on cruise ships they go to the cruiser you know yeah of course i mean what does happen if your car dies uh you have radios you 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 are you have extra tire you have more tires you have extra if you make the main thing your car for it to die just like that is very rare yeah you have two two tires two extra tires so you just change a tire but in the whole of the country, you don't have Wi-Fi. There is no reception. If you're at the bottom of a canyon, there's no reception. So all you need to do is pray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or, or wait for somebody to come through that road to help you. Yeah. So, so essentially, it's like you don't leave the car. I mean, because that could be the end of you. I mean, you stay next to the car and kind yeah. of, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, observe what is happening around you and uh, wait for somebody to come and help you. Uh, do, do you do, do you carry guns and stuff like that when you're when you're on these? Uh, no, you just kind of that that is the that is a no no. for the camera. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, you know, I, I, I was just um, wondering, you know, like, I mean, no, I was just wondering, you know, like, what happens, car dies, you know, like, you're in midnight. Uh, hey, you don't drive for several at night. All you do is the driving is usually in the daytime. So daytime. if you go to car at 3 or 4 p.m., there's always going to be somebody coming. Yeah, okay, so so that that's that's how it is. Tell me a little bit about uh, cheetah feeding. I mean, that is, I've seen this this video, and there's a cheetah in the car with, next to the guy. And then the cheetah kind of goes like, <laughs> yeah. and then in the, in the window of the car, you're seeing like three horses, you know, <laughs> just the, she's he hunting. Are, this is uh, Flash. His name is Flash, that Flash. cheetah. His name is Flash and it's a big kitten. It's a, it's a you know, he, he looks impressive, but uh, the man that's in the car with him, his name is Goran. He's, um, they call him the cheetah whisperer. And he's... Uh, rescues a lot of cheetahs that um, the parents have been hunted so they bring it to him for him to re- you know to give them a second chance yeah 
Yeah. So that's what he does. He's dedicated. He's from Sweden. So that's what he does in one of the places I go to, Bagatelle. Mm -hmm. And uh, Flash um, is very connected with Goran. So that's why he doesn't, you know, they hang out. Yeah, all the time. Out together. But, you know, Flash is still a wild animal. And uh, the reason he's looking at those horses is because he's a predator. <laughs> he's still I mean, at the end of the day. So it will always, you know, make him want to attack. Uh, it will be with him. I mean, like, you know, I, I was just, you know, like to, to, to pet that kind of thing is, I mean, I don't know. It, 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 it seems wonderful. And, you know, like to have a, to have a pet like that. Uh, must be, but must be incredible for Goran. And uh, yeah, in the end, we will we will definitely go through the list of, of of your partners and everybody who are actually you know involved in this in these tours. Yeah. But before we do that, Susuvle, and uh, I mean, or Mars, if you will, tell yeah. me, do you remember the first time going there? Because I mean, this is kind of like this area is is literally holy grail for. A lot of photographers. I mean, and it seems that you know, like the, the, the photos are everywhere and, and all of that. But still, there's that feeling of, I don't know, like a really special place that I don't think it will ever be, uh, you know, like uh, I, I don't know, viewed as I don't know something popular. Uh, what what was it like the first? When when was the first time you went there? I went there, I think, three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, it's a national park, so you you pay a fee to go in, and it's a huge area which is protected by the Namibian government. And you just drive, you just drive in this amazing park, and everything around you is dunes, dunes, and it's just it's everywhere. And like I say, all you say is wow. Yeah. That's, because. You just stop the car many times. You go up a dune. You go, you, you you take a photo of a tree next to a dune. Everything is different than what you've seen. And you got beautiful orange. You got yellows. You got browns. You have a lot of different natural colors. That's always like. Uh, and then you have the wildlife around. You got the wildebeest. You got the oryx. You even have the small things, you have small lizards, you have everything you can think of there. And um, the contrast between dunes and animal together, it's just a good combination for photos. So so you will see some of my photos with oryxes in with sand dunes. And um, and that's what it's that's what it's like. It's uh, it's up to you, uh, the photographer, to to take photos and just to really look for something special. It's the same way. You take photos anywhere, but when you have this in front of you, you don't even, it's like going, it's like a kid going to a candy store. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's... It's, it's everywhere, you want to stop everywhere, you you don't want to leave the, the, the area, the, because, you know, you it's everywhere around you is a photo opportunity, so it's, it's it, it could be overwhelming, yeah. Did you uh, did you ever spend the night there, I mean, like in, in a tent or, or, or something like that, and... Um... No. The park because you have to leave around 6 p.m. or 7 p.m. Ah, you gotta go. the yeah, there's a gate you go in and then you have to leave because you register your car and then they know who has been in and who has been out. So they shut the park at uh, unless you get special permission. If you want to do some star trails in the um, dead blade, you could get, but it's very hard to get permission. But usually you go there early in the morning or late in the afternoon to get those beautiful long shadows. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's when you see really the way um, the light comes through and the way the, the shadows are made is quite my, amazing. I mean, uh, what, what is the earliest that you can, you can get there, actually? It opens at 6.30 six, six in the morning. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, okay. so you just So it's a good time to go because it's still very low and it's not hot. But um, also in the late afternoon, it's quite good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just it's not too high. You know, it's a it's a good time because you have these long shadows, and that's what people want. But you know, sometimes I go there in the middle of the day. Yeah. And um, and it doesn't matter. You do a bit of editing and light room, and that's it. No, no. I mean, absolutely. I mean, light light is light, light is light is how you use it. You know, like that that that's for sure. Yeah. Have you ever seen any flowers on those dead trees that that, that are no. basically photographed? You know, like to no. They're just absolutely dead. There's not no no flowers. 
No, there is like, ever. ever. There's not. Unless you put a flower there, <laughs> there's no flower. <laughs> no, it's, it's just, no, no, I mean, like the flowers there and take photos, and people say, wow, it's in bloom, but now. No, no, I understand. I mean, like, obviously, they, they look absolutely kind of like it. they've been dead for a while. Been dead so. for 4,000 years. So yeah, well, I mean, the, bloom, that would be something special. I, I I was I was literally thinking thinking of that when I asked this question. I was like, hmm, that would be kind of yeah. no, because I mean, in, 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 in where I am in Bali, like you you can cut the tree and uh, and the, the branch and you leave it, and it's a dead branch, and all of a sudden they're and they're I'm, after after a, yeah after ten days they're they're leaves. So so yeah, I was just thinking of that. Uh, yeah, what is it like in there? Yeah. yeah. What is it like to 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 climb one of these dunes, especially when when the when the wind starts blowing? Because I mean, like it can be quite challenging. I mean, the, the the they're not they're high. Obviously, they're not crazy high, but you're going through some, quite a soft sand. And what is the climb like? It's very. It's you gotta be in shape. It's like because it's just like walking on the beach with thick sand. Yeah, uphill. That's exactly that. It's like walking on the beach, but up here, like that. Yeah, yeah. For, so, so it's for, just for about uh, an hour. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, being in shape, that's that's one thing that I need to do. Uh, I've seen a couple of photographs with uh, with ja uh, I think that 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 is Jackals, uh, and it seems that you you were fairly close. And I've I've never seen I've really never seen uh, any animals really in that kind of area before. So and you said that there are a lot of animals, and obviously I've seen through your photographs that that that, uh, that they come around. Uh, yeah, jackals. Yeah, there are jackals, but that's in a different area. That's in the Skeleton Coast. Have you ever climbed uh, the the dune and realized that you forgot a bottle of water? Does that happen? Uh, yeah, it happened. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, because, <laughs> I you know, because you think, oh, that's okay. I'll just come back and get a uh, a glass of water. But now, it's not. It's no. it's uh, It's very, very, very hot. It's one of the hottest places in uh, in um, in Namibia. So it's hot. it goes up to 40, 45 degrees. So you need a bottle. Of water. You need to drink because you sweat and you walk through that sand. And that's the only hard bit that you, the only hard exercise you would do in Namibia because the rest of the time, you know, you just, you don't really need, you don't really do so much workout. Yeah, you need water. I've, I've yeah. been in a situation where I had no water because my car got stuck, my four by four, because it's very deep sand, got stuck um, because you've got to be on high four wheel drive. And at one point I was on low four wheel drive and it just started to sink in. So I walked across. And I had those guys going up and down, just pull me out. But I walked through all the way with no water, all the way to the dunes. I walked for about an hour and a half and I had no water. And trust me. Oh, that's bad. Yeah, it happened once. Wow. That's, uh, that's why now I go really fast on the thick sand, really fast. Because you, you can, if you don't have experience, you can, you can sink in yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. I mean, like that—that that sounds uh, not pleasant. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, next, next, next location that is—I mean, incredibly interesting and also very, very, very popular, uh, uh, well-known thing is uh, Kolmanskop, the the, uh, the Diamond Rush. When in like the, 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 I didn't know in two in nineteen oh eight the worker his name was Zacharias Lewala found a diamond while working this area and then showed it to his supervisor German railway inspector August Stouch and then they built the town with a hospital ballroom power station school theater sport hall casino and ice factory what is it like there I mean now this is a banded town that is been eaten by by sand yeah that used to be where they invented the x-ray machine that's where oh. the x-ray machine was invented so oh, every wow. time you go to the dentist or you got you ate something weird and it goes through it was there because people were stealing diamonds so that's one thing they don't know is that Coleman's cop is the place where it, it started Oh, wow. Even though it's a place in the middle of nowhere, that's where the machines were invented. So when you go there, it, 
every you see that uh, there are like really amazing houses that were built because a lot of money was coming in. There were schools, there were hospitals, there were all kinds of. Um, it's a, it's a town that was built on diamond money, and uh, because people used to find a lot of diamonds there at the time, uh, so that's why you see all these amazing houses. But then there was the war. And there was also uh, a lack of funding also because the diamonds started to go. They couldn't find any more diamonds. So everybody had to leave and they left the way it was. They left the whole town the way it was. And then because it's built in the desert, through the years, you got a lot of sandstorms. And then just the sandstorms just destroys everything. But at the same time, it gives it as a nice, it's nice because you go in and the sand is taking over those houses. So it's a great place to take photos because it's weird to find the sand taking over. Yeah, it's, it is incredibly, incredibly picturesque area, really. Yeah. I mean, have you ever camped there? Have you ever spent the night? No. No, because they're closed. It's also an area. Also. Where it's also an area where it's very restricted. So you can't really spend the night there unless you really want to. Mm -hmm. Very spooky place. But, uh, you know, you, you have Luderitz not too far, which is 10 minutes, maybe not 20 minutes away. Uh -huh. and you just, and that's it. It's not uh, the closest town that you can stay. You know, I, I I saw some 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 guys who actually camped there, and it was it was kind of like really eerie. The, the the wind picked up, and everything was kind of like really really eerie. The, the the whole atmosphere of the town, I'm sure, at night is really incredible. So, when is your perfect perfect time to go go there? I mean, like obviously early morning and and, and the afternoon would be the perfect light, but it doesn't really matter, does it? It doesn't matter because uh, as long as you have nice shadows, beautiful yeah. shadows windows you know living on the floor um, it's quite far to go there because um, it took me two days to get there because it's it's really far out it's like on the on the southwest of Namibia so when you go there you know you just want to get there you don't worry you know about the time you just want to get there more than anything of course and uh, as soon as you get there, you're, you're a bit tired, you know, you do a lot, a lot of driving until you get there. So you just want to get it out of the way. You go there, you take photos and then you're out because yeah. you're tired. By the time you get there, you're not, you, you, you're tired. So it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah I, was, I mean, if I was staying a few days around the area. Maybe I would decide when to go, but uh, any time is good because you still have that thing where you have access to the whole area. I was the only one there actually when I went the whole the only one in town. Wow. When I went there and you just you know you go in one building another building there's photo opportunities everywhere. Yeah yeah I, I mean, it, there's, it, it, there it's it's everywhere but it doesn't really matter you can go any time. For night photography it you know you probably need special permission to stay there overnight. But uh, it could be done I think yeah. Yeah 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 absolutely. Um no, I mean, like some some of the most incredible photos of, of yours are, are, are flamingos, and uh, uh, we go to Welvis Welvis Bay. Uh, what is it like there? Uh, what is it like? I mean, it, these these photographs of flamingos are, are are incredible, man. I mean, like it's just uh, it's just incredible. What does it smell there? <laughs> I heard well, this story that they are pooping on their on, on their on their legs, and it's just the stench is kind of uh, potent. Well, this the smell that you that you will you might smell there is sulfur. Uh huh. Sulfur because there are areas because it's also an area where they have a salt factory. Mm -hmm. They make salt, and you also have lagoons, pink lagoons, and it's um, because of uh, sulfur basically in the, yeah, on yeah. the earth. So you have that smell that you can smell. Uh, when you go there, but the good thing about that area is that uh, it's untouched. So you have thousands of flamingos on the way to the dunes that hit the Atlantic. So while this bay is a small town that uh, you have to go through the flamingo areas where all those salt pans are, the lagoons, until you get to the sand dunes and it's um and that's why if, if you're lucky you won't have any mists remember you're on the skeleton coast 
Mm-hmm. So it's a lot of mist, a lot of mist coming from the sea. So you have to be able to get there before or after the mist because you don't know when it comes. So it's very hard to be sure that you're going to get the good shots because the weather changes very quickly. So, yeah, it's a good place for flamingos because they're there all the time. Are you ever, I mean, doing like because I, I saw that the, the marine life, or also I saw seals, and 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 uh, and it's just the marine life seems to be you know thriving there. Uh, are you doing any of any of that stuff, or the seals on the beach? As as we go, you will see that's what the jackals feed on mm-hmm. dead sea, baby seal. So that's oh. what the jackals there, because that's where they get their food from. Maybe if you're lucky, you will see a brown hyena. Because that's the only place that there are food, and there's huge colonies of seals um, on the beach. But you will be driving for about an hour until we get to the top of the dune. We drive through the sand until we get to the top of the dune, and over there, I mean, it's great photo opportunities. And that's where I saw the jack. I took a photo of the jackals because yeah, you yeah. still have dunes, but the jackals uh, used to see us when we had lunch, so they kind of approach us. They're used to us. They kind of approach us because they know they can get some food. And that's where I got that shot where they came towards yeah, me. They're... They came towards me sniffing out the food, but it's not like they were they wanted food more than anything. And I had my wide angle lens. Of course. Really low, and then I took that shot that uh, worked out pretty nice. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that, that shot is really incredible. And it really feels like, I mean, they're really close. I mean, it's just. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it was uh, quite, quite yeah. something. Um, oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, uh, next next location for me would be uh, Damara Land. Uh, t- t- talking about two two things uh, on the way, you're you're meeting with Himba people. What 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 are they like? Uh, what is the atmosphere in in their in their camps? How much time did you spend with them? Uh, you know, so uh, I would like to know a little bit about that. Well, there's two options. There's two things you can do. You can either go to their village mm-hmm. where they are and, and take photos, but that's, that's staged. Now, remember, my tour, everything is improvised. There's nothing staged. Everything is improvised. Everything you go, you don't know what you're going to get. You don't know the shots that you're going to get. Beautiful. So if you go to that village, it's going to be staged. Okay, so you have that. You have the dog, you have the family, you have the huts, you have the trees, you have the village life there. And then you walk around there. But that's not what I do. My, my best uh, shots of uh, the Himba people that uh-huh. you will see is basically as you drive uh, towards Damara land, they're always selling things on the side of the road. Okay. And the thing is that you isolate, there's probably three or four of them. There's not many of them, like in a village. So the good thing is when you drive, you have this beautiful backdrop, mountains and hills and canyons. All you need to do is you stop there, have a quick chat with them, and use the background to get these amazing shots without having the dog, the grandma, the cooking, everything. Everything is just minimal. And this is, our, this is what we do on my tour. We just stop in some areas where they are, you know, their hair, their hairstyle or their, the way they are is very, is very traditional. So all you need to do is have a nice backdrop, position yourself, maybe buy a bracelet, maybe buy, buy something from them, take a shot and leave. Yeah, yeah, that's that sounds uh, that that sounds amazing. Absolutely. Uh, how do you communicate with them? Uh, uh, do you have a guide on the tour or? No, I'm the guide. I'm the driver. Okay. Uh, I don't. I mean, I just go there. And I mean, you're just kind of like with a lot of hand gestures and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, you don't really need to have a debate. You know, you just have a quick chat. But we're in ten minutes. Take the shot, and we're out. It's okay. Going all the village. It's quick, and I'm, I was I was happy with the shots I took. You know. So that's yeah, why I, tell, yeah. I warn people in the tour. Let's go. We're gonna stop here. Get your camera ready. Get a fast shutter speed. Get the angle, get the lens that you need, and we're just going to stop on the way. And you take shots of himbas. So it's not go- it's not an extended day- trip with the himbas. No, no, I understand that. 15 minutes, 
and continue and, on the way. And you're, you're, you're off. Yeah, no, no, I understand that. I mean, it, that sounds uh, that sounds like uh, like a lot of fun. I mean, like you know, you need to be prepared. You need to, you know, like yeah. get your shot as soon as possible. Okay. And we see yeah. them. I tell them what to expect. And there can be a bit of confusion and commotion going on, but if you get one shot, then that's good enough. Yeah, you're good. Okay. Uh, now we got to go to the biggest part of this thing because Etosha, that is the place that I kind of like really heard a lot about when I was growing up. I mean, that is the place. Uh, th- th- I mean, your your photographs evoke this this massive feeling of of space, so of isolation, uh, a certain type of loneliness. I mean, I don't think that the loneliness is the right word, but but there there is something about this this vast space. You're using animals as like there's not too many uh, 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 close-ups. I mean, like, animal is always in some sort of, a, you know, like in the in the, in the the element, which I really love about your... Yeah. Oh, the, 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 you're bringing a broader picture to, to, to the whole thing. Tell me about a little, little bit about the Tosha, and especially these giraffes in the clouds. I mean, uh, it looks like clouds, but uh, yeah. tell me about these shots. Okay. Uh, the giraffe in a cloud was an edit of mine that I did in Lightroom. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, when you go to Etosha, you go to there's different entry points. There's Okakweo, there's Halali, there's Manutoni. It's a huge area which is dominated by a pan, a salt pan. Okay, it's dominated by that. Um, the landscape in Etosha is very dry. So you won't really, it's very rare. And there's water holes that you go to, to see the, the wildlife. So you usually have a map and you say, we're going to go to this water hole and you drive and you drive. And all you need to do is be aware of all the wildlife around you. It's very hard to spot wildlife, lions, cheetahs, leopards. They are there, but you have to, I have learned the hard way that you need a guide there because you can do a lot of driving and the line can be right next to you, but you don't see it. So you have people that are ex- experts. They speak on the radio between themselves. They say, we saw a lion family there. So instead of going all around this huge park, you know exactly where to go to find them because they're so camouflaged and it's so hard to see maybe under the shade or something that you need to have somebody to guide you where to go. Throughout yeah. you you no problem. Wildebeest, springboks, ostrich, you will see all of them, but like the other animals is quite hard. But um, I have a guy now that, uh, you know, he's always in touch with them. So it's it's easy to, to see the wildlife. But Etosha is when you, as soon as you enter the park, you feel that magic of that history of that special vibe. I can't explain. It's a, it's a sense of freedom and silence. And, you know, if I uh, do some edits on my photos, my photos are not so good, but somehow uh, my editing, like that giraffe that you're talking about, a bit of editing and a bit of creativity, can you can do something nicely. Because all I did was uh, put a bit of haze and brightness to give it a bit of a light. Uh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I did. But the sun was the same way, so I edited from the bottom all the way to the half of the giraffe. But um, yeah, all, it's, it's, it's so vast and it's flat. The Tosa is flat. There's no hills, no mountains, like, you know, it's flat. So, and it's just the, the roads are gravel roads. So that's why sometimes there's a lot of dust. Sometimes you'll see elephants completely white. Yeah, from the... Of the dust going to the water hole. It's very, 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 very dusty place. Tell me about these wa- water holes. What is it like there? Did you ever have a close water. encounter with a with, with a, yeah water holes? Uh, it, it just seems like a you know interesting place. It's a you know a party place if you will for for animals. I mean everybody are coming in. Uh, you know like I'm I'm guessing a lot of hunting is going around uh, uh, those areas. Have you ever had a had a close call with an animal? Uh, no, I have not. I haven't. The only thing they tell you don't don't leave your car, just stay in your car. Yeah. You know, in Antosha, you still have some people leaving their cars, but they're taking a risk because they, they people like to take risks. But main thing is to be aware, you know, not to drive too crazy. 
not to take any risks and you'll be fine. So all yeah. these people saying, oh, I'm going to be eaten by a lion, I'm going to have this. It's, it's so, it's impossible. It's almost impossible. Yeah. I mean, th for me, I mean, I, that's why I wanted to ask you, I mean, like naively, uh, because I've been, I've been watching all of these things and obviously I've seen people being taken, uh, you know, like f when they stepped out of the car and you see ele elephants sometimes charging uh, the things and that, that all looks, you know, like really dramatic, of course. And I'm sure this is very, very rare. But open open cars, they, they kind of like almost don't make sense to me because I mean like you're, you're next to the lion and he's going kind of like, well, your dinner and your lunch and three of you I'll bring to the ladies. Was there ever attack when you were inside of the car because this thing is open? No, there is no because um, um, there's no because the wildlife sees a car as a different Entity. It's a big animal. Yeah, they don't that they don't see it as food, or they don't see it as danger. The minute you step out of your car, all the wildlife would run. If you stay in your car, they don't even bother. But the minute you step out of your car, whether it's a prey or a predator, they see you differently. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean that that is that is a very interesting. I mean, like I, I was thinking that that is actually what is happening, but I mean, just kind of like, uh, you know, humorously and logically, kind of. Oh my God! I mean, this is open, and there is a freaking lion that can just kind of decide one day. Well, I'm gonna try. You know, I'm gonna just try for this. Uh, very hard. They, 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 that that, very that is just not happening. Nah. Yeah. yeah. Nah. Uh, how many times did you go, oh man, I wish I had a different lens. Uh, I wish that my drone is, you know, charged up. Like how many shots, what is the shots that eludes you that you want to get and you don't have it? Um, is there, is there, is there a shot? Yeah, there is a shot. It's, uh, it's an Oryx uh, or ostriches on the dunes. So that's that's the a lion, an elephant, a giraffe, or any wildlife on a sand dune. Uh huh. Okay. That's, I mean, like hope. That's what I, I hope. Sand, okay. I want a lion on the dune, or an elephant on the dune. Okay. I mean, uh, that's that 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 seems reasonable. Uh, <laughs> Photoshop. Uh, so. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, uh, with the, with all this technology that is available, uh, and then the drones and all these things going like really increasingly, they're getting better and better. It seems to me that now it's much easier to spot the animals. What do you think about that type of technology that is coming in, or that is just far far away in in the game? I think that uh, you have to be, you know, when you use a drone, you have to be careful not to be too intrusive. Uh -huh. uh, you got to be having a very good distance and not to scare them away. Uh, but it's another, you know, it's just, it's another tool to take photography, whether you have a huge zoom lens to get very close ups. Drones can be like that, but you have to respect the laws of the country, the national park. You got to be really aware of that and not take, uh, not take um, just wild risk like this because, you know, for as a droner, we want to keep the drones the drone community, uh, a, a, a place where everybody's aware and re responsible. So we want to, because we love drones, we love photography, we don't want to risk um, endangering the wildlife or being in trouble with the law. We, we have to respect that. So it depends. For me, a good zoom lens or a, a, a good drone shot has to be, um, has to be a calculated uh, photo it can't just be like that if they say no drones then we, there's no drones filming but if i go to a game reserve and the owner says yes you can and i say ask you for, for for permission then i can take some drone shots of, of wildlife because i have his permission and it's not a national park and things like that yeah okay uh, tell me about one thing and that is uh uh what is it like for these people who are who are attending your your workshop? Because Africa seems to be 
on a lot of people's bucket lists. And, and I'm, I'm assuming that you have some people who, who were there, you know, like on these workshops, you know, for the first. Yeah. Like being surrounded with people going, wow. Yeah, well, Namibia is different than Kenya or Tanzania or Uganda or Zambia or any of those countries because uh, it's a different kind of safari. We, we are not stuck in one lodge going for game drives. It's different. We move around the whole of the country. So we're touching different areas and we get out of the car a lot to take photos. We're not stuck in the car. We get out. Yeah. So between point A and point B, we'll start maybe 30, 40 times to take photos. So that's the difference. We're just there to enjoy the country and have fun and not be stuck all the time when we go on games or to be stuck on your seat. We have, we can walk around, we can uh, get ourselves in position for good shots, but we are always looking at what's around us. And also, um, you know, whether it's a canyon, whether it's a desert or sand dune, we're out, we're out of the car. We're using the car uh, to go to destinations, but also being able to leave and take our time taking a photo without rushing. That's the difference between on a game drive where you have a lot of people right behind you. You know, if you see uh, Pride of Line, everybody's following each other to take that shot. Or you go to the yeah. migration, everybody's there with their jeeps taking a shot. We don't have people around us. We are on our own. Yeah, which is, that is. Which is better. I mean, way. we don't have everybody behind us. No, no, that, that is a beautiful thing. I mean, it's, it's a unique, unique, unique experience, and that that is all, all you can really hope for in, uh, you know, like from this type of thing. I mean, I would definitely choose to do it that way rather than, you know, like uh, I mean, ever really for all of the groups. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, I promised to do this, and I think it would be a very good thing to do, and, and that is to mention all of the partners that you are working with uh, in Namibia, and I'll, I'll, I'll have the, the, the links to the people, because, I mean, obviously everybody now are, uh, are, are struggling, and uh, hopefully somebody will see it uh, and then yeah. go and contact these people. So, so who, are the, who are the partners, who are the people that you are doing this with? Well, I'm working with different, uh, I'm working with different lodges. One of them mm -hmm. is uh, Bagatelle. Yes. Kalahari. One of them is uh, Desert Hills. Uh, one of them is Vingo Clip. They are all on my website. And for Fantastic. car rental, I use Nam Vic. Okay. They are very good with um, really good four by fours. I work with uh, Desert Tracks, which is um, for the tours on the on the sand dunes. Uh, and that's about it, really. These are my main people: lodges. Uh, and then uh, a car rental, which is yeah, epic. definitely. I mean, I, I will link up uh, all, all all of these guys in the uh, below the our interview and all that. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna end this on the on the on the on the England note. You are in Brighton. Yeah, and uh, seriously, I mean, Brighton wasn't on my radar, but after seeing the photographs <laughs> that you're taking there, I'm kind of like. Maybe I mean like one. It is it is incredible. I mean seriously, I have no interest uh, being in the cities whatsoever. But this this photography is really really special. Tell me about going around. You're also organizing tours in in, in Brighton, and you know the, the prices are really really great. So so tell me a little bit about these tours that you're organizing. Tell me about photographing Brighton itself and living there. What is it like? Okay, well Brighton, the good thing is in the, the south coast of England, and you have beautiful sunsets. You have also the South Downs, which is a national park around here behind. You have beautiful hills. You also have um, a lot of, uh, I'd call this, you've got castles not too far from here. You have National Trust parks not too far. And, you know, the weather is, is okay here in the summer. It's, it's pretty nice. But the sunset is, you've got also the starlings. You've got the murmuration between one building and another in the evening, in the winters. So you have a lot of special photo opportunities that you can do. Do you have a Seven Sisters National Park, which has the white cliffs, mm -hmm. the white chalk cliffs. So it's a quite good location for that. I mean, um, if you want to come to, uh, and do some photography here, we can always meet up and take some shots and then do some editing. But Brighton for me is a place I've always lived here in England. and. Um, it's a place I can I can call home. 
but it's a good that it's it's a good area because you have the sea. I like having the sea right next to me. I don't know than to be inland. And yes, that's, that's it. Fantastic. Hey, uh, I I just uh, I just found one question uh, that that I will never forgive myself for not asking regarding Africa. You don't seem to get getting too close to the animals i mean like it's it's always this kind of like landscapes and, and stuff like that uh not yeah. landscapes but i mean the animal what is the reason is it is it safety is it the the time really uh, to actually get really close to to uh lion ele elephant all that you do have some beautiful close-ups but not not too many let's say uh Be it's mostly you know yeah because uh because I'm not really, uh, I will probably spend one day with a lion or two days with a lion. But to be really close up with lions, it's probably putting a, one of those remote cameras. That's yes. the closest you will get to or having, you know, using your remote to to do that. I don't, I don't do that. I, you know, a lot of people do it. I try to do something a bit different with the close ups with lions. Um, because Namibia is not just about lions. It's more about everything else that's, you know. Everybody takes pictures of lions and leopards, and it's more yes. or less the same. More or less the same, but for me, it's mainly the story of what's in the area, the, the grass, the the mountains, the sky. That's mainly the whole thing. Well, if you take, if you zoom in on a lion's head, okay, you can find a nice expression. But there is much more information in one of those big landscapes. There's much more information that that's what people like in photography. They like to see all the details because it just tells a story. If you got one great shot of a line, it may be good, but there's much more to offer on one of those images. Beautiful. I mean, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this was a big wow. Uh, uh, I, I wish you all, all the best. I, I hope that you will get to Africa uh, well as soon as possible. And uh, I, like I said, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thanks for having me then. All right, cool. Fantastic.